Hi everybody, it's Dr. Lori. Can you guess the most valuable? Right off the top, here's a lunchbox from the 1970s, a NASA lunchbox, right, from the 1970s. It's in okay condition. What does that mean? It's in good condition, so you know, the hinges still work, and a little bit of water damage. You can see a little bit of the rust around it. Uh, it does have the matching thermos because the matching thermos, of course, impacts value. And I remember the 1970s lunch boxes pretty well, I hate to admit. And actually, this is exciting for me. This is not my lunch box, but this particular lunch box is exciting for me because um, I actually grew up in one of those, I went to elementary school in one of those what were called the open space classrooms. Mine in the country, the open space classroom for elementary school kids, for little kids, grammar school kids, was in fact um, a very big innovation in education. And my school was the first in the country to open like that. So we had open spaces. So we didn't have just classrooms with desks. We had actually tables and kids could walk around and sort of experiment with how they were learning. It was a whole big experiment. And uh, one day when I was in kindergarten, which was called Friendship 2, all the classrooms were named for the NASA missions. And mine was, kindergarten was Friendship 2. And one day we walked in, a very tall man was standing in the front of our amphitheater. We used to have a big circle that we would sit in. And we'd have different colored upholstered seats that we would sit on as little kids. This very tall man was there and they said, we want to introduce you to an astronaut and it was Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong actually visited my kindergarten classroom when I was a little kid all those years ago. He had already gone to the moon. Alan Shepard was also there, two great astronauts. So this made me remember that. So what I was trying to get to with that story was, you know, antiques are about memories and they're about objects that stir up emotions and it's exciting to see those particular types of things like this. This particular piece, if you're wondering what it's worth, dates to about 1970, just a year after, of course, the moon landing. And value on this piece, $125. There was a time when, of course, lunchboxes were really, really collectible and really a lot of money, kind of like the cookie jar market that goes up and down. The lunchbox market goes up and down as well. So in 2019, you saw a big spike in NASA collectibles because it was the anniversary of the moon landing from 1969, of course. But again, right now, this worth about $125 in good, good condition. Okay, and then there's this object. Do you like this? This is a pin, jewelry, and this particular piece relates to something called Egyptomania. And Egyptomania is really, really a fun type of jewelry style from the 1920s. Now, what, is the, what do the Egyptians have to do with Art Deco style, right? Well, the Egyptians have a lot to do with it because this relates to the interest, widespread global interest, in the exhuming of King Tut's tomb, which took place in 1922. And that particular archaeological success story in fact, showed us all of the riches that King Tut buried himself with or was buried with. This kind of form is called a scarab and it has the wings so it looks actually like the beetle in flight and it is actually a carved stone in the center. You might remember these from the movies, you know, like Elizabeth Taylor wore a scarab, a big scarab necklace when she played Cleopatra in the 1963 blockbuster Cleopatra. So this particular piece is a pin from the 1920s. It's sterling silver and marked sterling. It's got to be marked sterling if it's sterling. If it says something else, it's not sterling unless it says 925, which is the numbers for the 92.5% purity of sterling silver. Having said that, this particular scarab piece dates from about the 1920s. It's very Art Deco, streamlined designs, really geometric with this circular form in the middle. So this particular piece is also an ancient symbol. Ancient symbols are oftentimes used not only by the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, but also by the Native Americans. The Native peoples like to use ancient symbols too. So when you see some of these ancient forms, you want to think about those particular background elements in the history of this piece of jewelry. What's it worth? $400. It's a really nice example of Art Deco jewelry. This piece is an Asian vase. Is this the most valuable? Well, let's see. It's a porcelain ceramic Asian vase. It has peony flowers on the bottom. Those peonies are very indicative, of course, of some of the elements of the Asian culture. That idea that, for example, carp or koi fish relate to strength. Peonies usually relate to longevity, long life. 
Um, oftentimes you'll see these particular flowers decorating everything from Asian screens to ceramics and of course to kimonos and other court wear, if you will, couture in, the, in that particular area. This particular piece has a very, very nice flowing neck. I like a long neck on a vase. I like a vase to be nice and tall and slender in the neck form. And basically that form that shows you a bulbous bottom and a slim and a contrasting slim neck and then a flared top is really a nice form. That's what you look at when you're looking at pieces of ceramics. I want you to look for contrasting forms that complement each other. So you've got a nice round bulbous bottom and then you've got a nice sleek middle and then you've got a flared top. It's really nice. Your eye flows very beautifully up and down the form. And that's a mark of a high quality piece. Porcelain, fired at a high temperature, also a quality, also a mark of high quality. So you want to think about that. I really like this piece. This piece dates from about 1900. Now you're probably thinking, Dr. Lori, 1900? Really? I would have thought that was like an ancient Asian piece from the 10th century AD. No, it's from 1900. Why? The late part of the 1800s and the early part of the 1900s is known as the Orientalist time period. And that's a time period when you see everything that has to do with the styles of the Asians coming into European and American decorative arts or furniture design or home decor. So early, late 1800s, early 1900s, you're looking at the Orientalist time period. And that's what this is. So this piece dates to circa 1900 or about 1900. And this particular piece is worth $100. Nice. It's pretty. I like it. This next piece is a bottle. I know you all love bottles. I know you think every bottle is valuable. You have to learn about bottles. I've been teaching you about bottles on these videos and in other places, social media, my website. I want you really to learn about bottles. Whether they're cobalt bottles or bitters bottles or liquor bottles or bean bottles, I want you to get this. And there's a couple of things you want to look for. Some of it has to do with the lettering on the bottle. Some of it has to do with the seam of the bottle. Some of it has to do with the color. So if you look at this particular bottle, the embossed letter, lettering is there, right? Relatively well. Look at the type face, right? Look at the size of the font, the letters. Look at the spacing of the font, right? The letting. Look at the kerning of the font, right? So that's, of course, the spacing as well. I want you to look at the whole bottle, look at it as a form. Look at what kind of top the bottle has, it's also what you want to look for. Whether you have a painter's top, whether you have a cork top, a screw top, all of those things will impact value. Color impacts value very, very high. Lots of people are looking for different colored bottles. This is a cobalt bottle. Now, bottles are usually colored for a couple of reasons. It has to do with what goes inside. So you want to think about what goes inside. So if it's something that's a liquid or a chemical that could change, you don't want light to get at it. So you want to think about these particular types of colors. Some of the bottles actually, the manufacturers or the advertising um, manufacturers said, you know what, let's always have our bottle be blue or always have our bottle be green or always have our bottle be amber. And what's interesting about this is certain bottles relate to a certain color. For example, uh, the whiskey producer Seagram's, right, who makes scotch and such, actually even asked the architect Mies van der Rohe when, they, when he was building the skyscraper in Manhattan, New York City, he said, we want our skyscraper building to look like the color of our liquor or our bottles or actually our product. And that was one of the things that connects. So remember, those connections are going to be important to collectors, important to buyers, important to sellers if you're trying to market your pieces. Is this the most valuable? Well, this little bottle is actually um, a bottle, again, from the early years of the 20th century. It's only worth 20 bucks. So you've got to know the characteristics of your bottles. All right. This next piece is a piece that is kind of near and dear to my heart. And this one is called the Official Preppy Handbook. And it's an actual book from the 1980s. Now, many of you are thinking, oh, Dr. Lori, what could a, a soft cover book from the 1980s really be worth? I see these at flea markets at yard sales all the time. When you see these pieces, there are certain pieces that are sitting in the wrong market. And this becomes important. Well, what do I mean by the wrong market? Well, they're sitting in the wrong market. So they probably will be worth more in a different market. So people will say, oh, you can't get that much for it. But in fact, you can get a lot more for it. So 
This particular piece is the official preppy handbook. The 80s are really hot now. You're seeing revivals of everything from Madonna's Like a Virgin album to, of course, some of the great sports teams of the 1980s. So I want you to think about the 1980s as this next collecting cat time period. Try to scoop all this stuff up now. But that's for another video. That's for one of my other selling videos. This is what I want to tell you here when you're trying to guess the most valuable. It's in good condition for a soft cover. When you're looking at a soft cover book, the dog-eared, it's called dog-eared, when you've got a crease at the corner, you wanna stay away from those if you can. If you can prevent yourself from doing that, don't fold down a page, always use a bookmark, right, if you're using these. But this particular preppy handbook talked about what culture was like mainly teenage culture in the 1980s. You know, should you wear a Fair Isle sweater? Should you wear your pearls? Do you wear your Izod collar up or your Izod collar down? And what does that mean? All kinds of things. It's a lot of fun. It's a guidebook for the 80s and it's an important piece. Do you know what it's worth? Is it the most valuable? It's worth $250 in this condition. There also is, of course, a hardcover um, version. The hardcover version, worth a little bit more. Then there's this piece. This is a gold bracelet. It's a gold chain link bracelet. I talk a lot about jewelry and I talk about jewelry because if you can understand the styles that were popular in a particular time period, it's very easy to date jewelry. I talk a lot about costume jewelry too. And if you can identify in fact which types or which makers you have in your piece of costume jewelry, you're gonna do even better in identifying it and then connecting the right value to it, the correct value to it. This particular piece is a 14 karat gold linked piece from the late 1970s, early 1980s. It is marked 14 karat gold. So now are you wondering where do I look for the marks? On pieces of jewelry, I want you to look for the marks on the clasp. I want you to look for the marks on the back of a pendant. I want you to look for the marks on the side of a bracelet. So be careful, look everywhere and get out the loop. Get out the magnifying glass loop, look for it. Because you really need to make sure you're looking at those marks. Those marks are very important. Okay, a 14 karat gold bracelet. Now I love bracelets. I like to have stuff on my wrists. I like watches, I like bracelets. And I don't know why, I think it was from being a little kid. My dad always had a watch and he always had a different watch and they weren't all good watches, just any old watch, something to keep time. And he was big on make sure you're there on time. So he always would say, well, we'll get you a watch, like basically to make sure you're there on time. But he was a little bit of a watch aficionado. He liked watches. And I tend to like something on my wrist too. I kind of feel naked without something on my wrist. I don't know if any of you are like that, but I have that kind of thing. This bracelet is a nice bracelet. It's a gold link bracelet. So when you're looking at bracelets, I want you to think about the links on a bracelet, okay? And there are different types of links and different styles. You've probably heard about the San Marco link, or maybe you've heard about a Gucci link, or maybe in, a, in each Italian types of links. All different types of links, box links, lots of different types of links. This particular link and is important. It's really very nicely designed. It's all handmade. So that means they do a jewelry cast of each individual link and then they put them together. It's really labor intensive, which is usually what shows high quality and raises the price. You want the thing that's gonna raise the price, so you want the workmanship to be excellent. That's what you're looking for. This particular bracelet is a good example. So look for the links and understand whether or not the links are hollow, okay? So, because if you bang that bracelet, you could dent it because it's hollow. Now they're making bracelets all different ways. They're putting a material inside, so if you have a bangle that's hollow, you're not using all that solid gold inside, or you would be using another metal, right? A lesser quality, non-precious metal, right? Inside, so you don't, when you bang it, you don't have like a dent, like when you're dent in the car. So you wanna think, did you hear that dent in the car? <laughs> that's the Connecticut accent. It's not really yet Boston, but we're getting there, right? The car. Um, anyway, this particular bracelet is a beautiful example from the late 70s, early 1980s, value on it $800. So it's a nice bracelet, really good. This piece is Charles and Diana's wedding engagement mug for their wedding. So this is a kind of an interesting collectible. It's a royal collectible. It's a tourist collectible. It's a wedding collectible. It has a lot of collectability. Okay, this particular piece. So if you're thinking about what's the most valuable, think about all of those collectible categories. Here's what happened to this particular piece. This particular piece was mass produced with transferware. Ceramic mug, they put that famous engagement 
image right on that particular mug. And, you know, Diana's wearing that famous sapphire that now, of course, Kate Middleton wears as her engagement ring, right? That famous sapphire and diamond ring that became the ring of the 1980s, right? So this particular piece shows Charles and Diana, their engagement. She's wearing, of course, that blue. And it's interesting how history repeated itself. If you see the engagement photo, of course, of Prince William and Kate Middleton, now Princess Catherine, you in fact, or you would in fact see, again, the same blue, a blue dress, and to highlight the red.